Australia and New Zealand. Max received his tertiary education in the University of Melbourne and was fascinated with the impacts of multiculturalism on contaminated land management globally. In the last 24 months, Max has been traveling between China and Australia to explore environmental remediation opportunities. Um, good afternoon everyone, um, I'm Max, and um, today I'm going to talk you guys through global impacts of multiculturalism on contaminated remediation. I suppose the uh, majority of us must have the experience working with people coming from a different culture, and sometimes understanding can be challenging, because I'm not the easiest person to work with, because we're from a different culture, I suppose. Um, but how do you actually put that in the context of environmental contaminated land remediation. Today, what I'm trying to do is um, I try to dissect this and actually explain the dynamics and some of the elements between multiculturalism and contaminated land remediation. And also, I'm just going to give you three examples, or maybe four examples. Um, examples of um, how things could go wrong uh, when they've you know, got multiculturalism involved and what the rationale is behind. So to start with, um, just a little bit, um, the interaction and elements between continent land management and multiculturalism actually very heavily depends on which country you come from or the various countries you come from. The main reason behind that is um, the political environment. For instance, how open is that country to um, international trade? How open is a country to um, Factors like relationship between, uh, between different countries, they, they will all have some sort of impact on um, how we're going to do our contaminated land remediation and um, the management. With globalization, it actually accelerates international trade in a sense that it's actually helping also making things a lot more difficult when it comes to contaminated land um, management. I'll try to explain this with examples later on. But with economic growth, um, with what we see here is we're getting a lot more investors coming from overseas and trying to utilize the resources here um, to either benefit local economy or to help their own country. Um, for the sake of today's discussion, um, I'm just going to use China and Australia as an example. Chinese in Australia and Australian in China, same thing in China. How's it going to make a difference? Um, to start with, I've got here um, three graphs from Mike Frank Research. They're on um, the national land development. And these stats were um, quite new, from, it's from 2017. And to start with, um, with, with these two data, 2015 and 2016, you've seen massive growth, um, 28, 26% to 38%. I'm guessing the main reason for this increase is that um, Chinese are, are opening their markets to the world and people carrying the money, they try to invest it elsewhere in the world, particularly Australia, when our policy is actually attracting all these investors from overseas that try to purchase land and development um, in Australia. While between 2016 and 2017, um, a couple of things happened. Banks in Australia have tried to increase their interest in probably some of the buyers who want their interest in Australia now. Or um, Chinese government is actually restricting um, their policy and actually make um, capital out outflux a lot more difficult. So people can't really take the money outside of China to do um, development or investment. Here in figure two is pretty much just summarize the average size of land that people are purchasing or developers are purchasing. And you can see uh, up to 2017, the average land size is roughly about um, two hectares, this size. And in figure three here, um, it explains 
explains, okay, for, for Chinese developers, also the economy pipes there a little bit more into, well, residential, but we still break it up into high density, low density, and medium density. And you can see with the apartment blocks, the black is actually gone down a lot in, in terms of proportion. So we actually get a lot more um, interest in, in the greenfield development. So if you to interpret this into content land management, you probably think about, okay, so maybe we'll get a lot more opportunities in greenfield um, jobs rather than just you know, normal city um, apartment development. Okay, um, so just some trends. Um, the first one is bank to property development we just discussed briefly, but um, there's an interesting fact I'd like to share with you, which is um, with, with all the um, Chinese developers, they normally are quite contamination adverse. But we do observe there's actually a, train, a, a trend shifting towards contained land site. I've got a number of developers who actually approach me and say that, Max, could you actually help me look into purchasing contained land site for development? Uh, a couple of reasons. Um, reason number one, it's obvious that contained land sites, they got less competition because people got scared. They don't want to purchase sites that could potentially drop stuff up and going nowhere. And number two, um, they're cheaper. That's, that's pretty obvious. So um, that's, that's one of the biggest drivers of people trying to move away from the normal residential development and try to move around those sites. And we also observe that a couple groups of people try to move away from normal residential development and into um, commercial and also agricultural land acquisition. With commercial um, development, there are a few reasons. Um, people become more interested in ongoing in income rather than just you know, one off type of development itself. Um, with that sort of development, I think um, the whole concept of environmental um, environment as this container land management has changed from remediation to ongoing management. For instance, people have been purchasing um, shopping centers. Shopping centers could potentially be used on landfill sites. If they try to redevelop that shopping center into residential, then on a sudden you would be thinking about how to remediate the site um, the technology or technical be too technical for that. But if they try to say, oh, yeah, I'm I'm buying this shopping center, I'm keeping it as a shopping center, I try to run it, then the whole focus would be on how you actually have the client to manage all the potential hazard and risk the site users or, or neighbors into. Agricultural land acquisition, that's a funny one. Um, people people would think um, the reason that they buying agricultural land is one that they're, they're really big, so it's pretty good for land banking, right? Um, but the real reason now is um, so AN, a, ANU has actually done, uh, done their research and they discovered uh, in China they had this um, food shortage because most of their croplands has been so contaminated that they can't really grow crops on them anymore. So they become it becomes almost a must for them to actually outsource land from overseas. You can't buy land overseas and bring it to China, but you can buy land overseas, grow your crops there, and then take your crops with you back to China. With that, it, it's, sort of, it's, it's sort of alerting at the same time, because um, obviously they stuff up their own um, environment in China with their crops, because they may have been using um, DDT, for instance, for, for many years and without proper cleanup. Would they actually bring with them the poorly um, managed practice to other countries and create more pollution in that way um, is possible. It pretty much means um, government officials and um, other stakeholders we have to keep a close eye on all these foreign investors and making sure they know what they're doing. They're adapting to the local uh, the local legislative uh, environment. Okay, moving on Australia and New Zealand, let's talk into China mm. and. Um, it's a bit weird because I have contaminated land management sitting on its own while they normally would cover everything pretty much. Um, because <coughs> of the way that um, Chinese people actually see where this is, it's separated from everything else. Um, if you approach someone, I think the government say, um, I work in the environmental industry, uh, the first thing they ask you is, oh, do, you do, ground, do, do you do wastewater? Um, that, um, yeah, yes and no, and then do you do air? So they sort of separate everything, and ironically, they think that river remediation is 
sort of the same as wastewater treatment. They don't see the link between different elements in the environment and how holistic it is uh, for the ecosystem to work. So um, I'll show you with, with examples how they stuff up some of the remediation projects by not actually tackling the problem correctly. And um, very interestingly with Kings presentation, waste management is actually one big emerging market in China. Um, it hasn't been made official, but um, the market there is really massive. We are facing the same issue with all our projects in Asia, same for China. So they're looking for a lot of experts to do their cycle cycling to sort, sort out their, their local issues. Okay, um, this is my first case study. When it comes to effective and effective ways, people always think, okay, how do you stuff up? Normally it's like a, a foreign, a foreign developer not understanding the, the, the legislation thing and then um, not looking to what sort of specialty material we have on site and then just put a building down and then um, pretty much posing health risks to, to site users and neighbor site users as well. But I want to move a step further. So let's say this is a vacant site and the building's ready to go up. Uh, what happens is with uh, Yuan Da. So you're in Australia, they like one of the biggest um, Chinese owned import exporting um, company. And what happened was in 2016, I think, um, they got busted with uh, both security actually uncovered one of the containers containing um, asbestos uh, containing the material. And the asbestos roofs and asbestos gaskets. Asbestos roofs went to uh, the Perth Children's Hospital with uh, the asbestos gaskets to risk it um, to the, uh, I think it's, it's proposed to the government building. Um, this is, this is definitely just a tip of the iceberg because this company, I think every year there'll be hundreds of shipments coming to Australia and so on suddenly you uncover one or two and there'll be a lot more smaller companies who draw a lot less attention and do all these combined shipment when things got mixed up. So um, why would people or why would importers take the risk of you know, importing potentially hazardous material into Australia, knowing that they'll be fine if they actually got discovered. Um, it's actually a trade-off, or a lot of them are sort of opportunistic in the terms of, I may be lucky, I may not be uncovered. Um, if I don't get uncovered with my you know, misconduct, I may end up you know, making millions of savings with you know, importing asbestos containing material for two reasons. One, they're normally cheaper to, to manufacture. Uh, two, they, they, they're cheaper to get here as well. Um, I do, I actually went to a couple of Chinese developers and asked them what their thoughts about this. And their thoughts sort of correlate with the size of the company. Normally the bigger the developer goes, the more, um, the more conscious of the reputation damage there will be. So they try not to, they, they will try to make sure things like this won't happen, but eventually it will still happen because of the um, tendering structure or how projects are being managed. I'm a developer, um, I, this, this is my tender for you know, getting all my building material. I'm subcontracting it out, so people actually give me tenders. Normally I judge by you know, who's the cheapest, who has the best quality, but do I really keep, keep a really close eye on what's coming in and out? Probably not. Um, and it could happen that Yuan Da, so they, they're like the, the importer of, of that material, but they're not necessarily the, the manufacturer of those material. They may not know that their asbestos containing. What's, what's gonna happen is, um, okay, there, there's so many layers in between, maybe the, uh, the, con the contents actually got swapped out before it actually left the port, or, um, the manufacturer simply just fake the certificate saying it's asbestos free while it's not. A lot of things like that can happen, so there, there are easily a million ways of these hazardous material can actually get into construction sites in Australia. Um, is there any way to try to monitor this and, and mitigate um, the risk? Yes, there is. Um, you pretty much need to educate um, the developer community to let them understand um, 
they could be held liable as well when things like that happen. It's not just uh, you, you. You can't you can't say free say no. Uh, I've got nothing to do with this. Uh, you sort of have to let them know this is your social responsibility, and, and legal wise, you could you could be held accountable as well because you agreed to use that and you haven't done, or you could uh, avoid you know importing hazardous materials or Australia or using them. And in here, a couple examples. Um, I find this quite interesting because they're both apartment developments and they're both fairly contaminated sites. Uh, one's in Vestavore in Victoria and the other one's West End in, in Queensland, in some reason they Brisbane. Um, I'll start with, let me put it this way, as, as an environmental consultant, it's pretty much our responsibility to make sure um, the client make um, informed decision. And with these two examples, one's built site in the landfill and the other one's built site in the tar manufacturing plant. The former one, um, the, the, the landfill sites, the client was really upset because she thought she's good to go with that site as she's done her due diligence. And she thought that report would actually get her through everything. But obviously the communication didn't go well as is um, the consultant passed over the information and then no one's actually tried to follow up with the, with the client to making sure that she understands what's actually her obligation and what would be happening. So it turned out that um, the, the assessment fee and also the remediation costs are a bit too high and then she's not receiving any support from the bank so she sort of had to dump that project and just leave it as a, a shopping centre. Whilst this one is actually classic because the, the message I got through from the consultant to the project manager but it didn't go any higher to the decision maker. Um, in, in Chinese culture, or I think a lot of Asian culture, we have this hierarchical problem where people from the lower end can't really you know, deliberately talk to the decision maker or um, the superiors. Um, the role of us become, becomes really important because when we step in as a professional, we can actually advise the decision maker directly. And, then, and sometimes we, we may have to communicate with um, with the person in contact to see how you can actually help them to actually get the message across. And in China, uh, time's running out, so I better get this through really quickly. Um, I think the biggest problem with China's market is they always believe there's a silver bullet to all sorts of environmental remediation projects. Every time um, when they come up to you and ask you, say, do you do environmental remediation? If you say yes, they, they'll ask you, can you give me a can you give me a, um, a solution or could you give me a, a strategy? Is that for sure, but what is your project and what sort of contamination you're facing? And a lot of times they don't have that answer for you, but they're expecting you to have the solution ready for them already. So um, it is tricky and comments in terms of dealing with Chinese uh, varies a lot. People, some, some people seem not to have any issue, but from my experience, a lot of us will, will have issues like communicate just to get the right set of data in front of us for us to further the communication and the reaction arc is very demanding. A lot of times they provide you with the information today and they, be, they will be expecting an answer tomorrow. But if you provide them with a people, big proposal or an answer, you will be accept, expecting a really long reaction arc for them to get back to you because they'll be price, comparison, uh, they're price comparing, they may, they may even leak your information to some of the local entities. Because of the, the government structure, they're so protective of their local entities. Um, for foreign companies to enter Chinese market, uh, just have a presence in China doesn't really guarantee you any work. You sort of have to form a partnership with some of the, the, the local companies and to use them as a shell to actually go for any jobs there. So to summarize, um, it's very important to understand the culture, but not the language. Uh, a joke that I always make fun of myself is um, when we say yes, it may not necessarily say yeah, mean yes. It's a no, it may be a yes. Uh, um, you can identify the risk involved with all these cross culture co uh, contaminate land uh, project because um, you have to understand who you're really dealing with. Can they actually pay the bill? Or will, will they be willing to pay that bill? I think, I think that's, that's pretty substantial. Um, Proactivities. Um, we're going to be really proactive in terms of engaging um, people from other cultures. 
this is sort of helping us particularly if you're interested in pursuing business in their country if you can actually invite them across and start the communication with like delegates and then take them to all the government officials and show them case studies and it should give them confidence and you at the same time educating them what's the right way of doing things um, case study talks that works very well sometimes they don't understand how, how, how capable you are in terms of delivering the project. But if you can actually take out case studies of what you've done previously and say, yeah, this is, this is the issue that we had and this is how we actually tackle it, um, and that will happen a lot. And time and patience, like I said, reaction art is really long, so you've got to be really patient and keep following up. And I think last but not least, power of mass media. Um, that's very helpful and when it comes to you know marketing your company or try to get jobs uh, the people coming from a different culture but at the same time be really really careful how you use them because they can destroy <coughs> you if you are saying something in front of mass media that is maybe slightly politically incorrect you could end up in jail so uh, yeah thanks a lot for your time